Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning as we continue our series in uh, the end times. I just pray, God, your blessing and help uh, send light uh, in place of darkness, truth instead of that which is not true. We uh, turn to your word now and we accept it uh, from your hand with gratitude. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who teaches us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Jesus had been teaching in the temple area of Jerusalem, and the time came to leave and go back to their bed and breakfast in Bethany. They paused at the summit of the Mount of Olives, looking back down toward Jerusalem. And when the disciples pointed out the, the marvelous buildings there, Jesus told his men that everything they saw was going to be destroyed. The disciples asked two, two very reasonable questions. When and what are the signs? When is this going to happen and what are the signs? Jesus answers the second question in verses 4 to 35 in Matthew 24. He waits until verse 36 to answer the first question. So as we study the six signs that he gives in verses 4 to 14, and we're going to look at three this week and three later, let us be reminded that the second coming that Jesus is talking about is the coming that he refers to in verse 27. So let's read verse 27. He says, For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. So this, he's talking about a cosmic, worldwide, bright as lightning return. This is the coming that happens at the conclusion of the seven-year time of trouble that we talked about last time, which is when the Jews finally receive Jesus as their Savior. I believe that all truly born-again people will have been removed seven years before this coming. So when he says in verse 27, and he talks about his coming being like lightning, that, what he's saying, is that these are the signs that he talks about, and the when, when he gets to that, uh, are, are not signs that will lead up to the rapture of the church. They are signs that he is about to physically return to earth. For us, the Gentiles, who are part of the of the uh, population of born-again people in the Church of Jesus Christ, for us, the next event happened seven years before what Jesus is talking about here. Before we read this, we should also mention that Jesus will mention a sign in verses 4 to 14, but often he will provide more detail later in the chapter so that is going to make us bounce around a little bit. So I hope you brought your Bibles. Let's start reading. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to, to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Well, logically, as we begin in uh, verse 4, logically, verse 5 comes before verse 4. So in verse 5, Jesus says, Many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. 
And so Jesus, in other words, is saying that right before the end, many people will step forward claiming to be me. So false Christ will arise. That's the first sign. Now, there have always been a few individuals around who claim to be Christ returned. Reverend Sung Young Moon uh, is someone alive today. Back in the, I think it was the 80s, he began to talk about how he was the return of the Messiah. But what Jesus is saying here is that near the end, the number of these imposters will increase greatly. Jesus uh, talks about this again, starting in verse 23. So look at what he says. So I'm in Matthew 24, 23. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, now I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is out in the desert, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. So... There will be a time, Jesus says, that, that everybody will be talking about different ones who claim to have been uh, to be Jesus' return. Have you heard the news? Someone will say. The Messiah is holding meetings down at the Van Andel. Let's get a ticket and go down and hear him. Or, Christ has been has returned and he's been invited to be on the David Letterman show. Or Christ has appeared in the Middle Eastern desert and Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and Christians are all flocking to him. He's on the 6 o'clock news tonight. Let's, let's tune in and hear what he has to say. Now the rise of these pretenders, Jesus says, is going to be encouraged by two things that he mentions in verse 24. So let's read the verse again. False Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. So what Jesus is saying is that there will be in these days preachers who stand up and encourage their people to trust in one or other of these pretenders, these false messiahs. And not only that, but the imposters and the preachers will be doing amazing miracles, convincing miracles that will sweep away all doubt. He says if it were possible, even the true believers would be fooled by all of this. And so that's why he says in verse 4, he gives the warning, watch out that no one deceives you. So here is what we want to learn here. The closer we get to the end, the more lies there will be. Satan is a liar and the father of all lies. And he grows in boldness hour by hour. Now that is a scary thing to me, but what terrifies me more is that people who own Bibles don't know what the Bibles say. Plus, they are fast losing their ability to, to think their way through problems and reason things out. And this leaves people ripe for the devil's picking. Dorothy and I attended church a couple weeks ago while we were on our vacation. And as we sat there in the congregation, we listened as a preacher explained spiritual gifts. This preacher said that God gives spiritual gifts to build yourself up. And Dorothy leaned over and she elbowed me and she says, that's not true. She's right. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12 that the purpose of the gifts is to build up the body of Christ. This preacher gave a long story about going to the gym and lifting weights and barbells and saying that just like you lift weights and build up your muscles, you exercise your spiritual gifts and you build yourself up. And he had it all backwards. He went on to say that all true Christians receive all of the spiritual gifts at once. And she leaned over again, Dorothy did, and she says, well, that's not what it says. It says the Holy Spirit distributes the gifts out 
individually and in special ways. Uh, you know, one person gets this gift or a blend of a couple gifts. It, we, it certainly doesn't say that we all get this, all the gifts. And then the preacher went on to say that, that the very gift that Paul taught that was the least of all the gifts actually was the most important. Now, most of what he said was pure baloney. What is amazing is this church is growing in numbers. They had, a, they had a county sheriff out there where the driveway meets the highway directing traffic. So many people were coming and going. So the church is growing in numbers and it seemed healthy in every other respect. It's just that the people don't seem to be growing in their understanding of the word of God. And I asked myself the question as I sat there, is the same thing true at FBC? Jesus tells one and all what his coming will be like. Let me read it again. He says, for as the lightning that comes up from the east is visible even in the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. It will be like a flash of lightning. It will be quick and sudden and worldwide and blindingly bright and unimaginably glorious. What it, what it won't be is severe, or excuse me, secretive and gradual and ordinary looking. That right there is all a person needs to know to figure out whether someone is really the Christ or not. Let me tell you, if you have to ask, he isn't. But I am telling you, in spite of the fact that Matthew, that Matthew 24, verse 27 is in the Bible, millions, not millions, billions of people in the world will believe that an, that an imposter that we know as the Antichrist, they will believe that he is actually the Son of God. Listen to me now. Jesus came with a hidden identity the first time, not the second time. Who he really was was covered over the first time, not the second time. I appeal to you to get out your Bibles more and learn what God says in his word. I am becoming convinced that the value of this sermon time isn't just what is taught right now or next week or the week before. It is also to spur you on as an individual, as a leader in your home, to spend time in the Word of God on your own. So the first sign that Jesus talks about is the coming of, of, of these false Christs. In verse 6 he goes on and he gives us the second sign. He says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So Jesus speaks here of a time of great international tension. There will be wars and rumors of wars flying about. He says that this time of tension will precede the end, but he's not saying that the end will occur just then. In other words, when there's a war, that doesn't mean that the end is here. Now, we know that within the past 100 years, the world has suffered two world wars and many other conflicts beside that. Jesus is speaking here of a third world war that will be worse than the ones that came before it. There never will have been a time of war as bad as this time. And that is saying something because there have been some terrible wars with some unthinkably great loss of life. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The word translated nation in our NIV is actually the Greek word ethnos. And we get the word ethnic from that word. The phrase people group would fit in very well here. So Jesus is talking about people group, rising against people group, and country against country. So remember the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda? Those were two people groups inside one nation. 
And Jesus is saying that as the time nears the end, the people groups, instead of just nations, will rise up and want to kill each other. Remember hearing about the Kurds in Iraq? The Kurds are people that live in the mountainous region between Iraq and Turkey. And, and uh, they don't really belong to either nation. Uh, Saddam Hussein tried to kill as many Kurds as he possibly could, and the, and the Turks kind of wish they weren't there either. So there, there are people within a nation that don't really have their own nation. More and more today, it's people groups hooray, who are at each other's throats. In Ireland, it's the Protestants and the Catholics. In Los Angeles, a few years ago, it was the blacks against the Koreans. In Iraq, right now, the Shiite Muslims are blowing up the Sunni Muslims. A while back in Czechoslovakia, the Czechs decided they couldn't live with the Slavs. Czechoslovakia is simply a, a compound word that, that puts Czechs and Slavs together. And so pretty soon the Czechs and the Slavs, they couldn't live together, and so they created the Czech Republic, and the Slavs lived somewhere else. The newest nation in the world, the last time I checked, is called the nation of Southern Sudan. It's the fifth, 54th country on the continent of Africa. The reason for the coming into being of southern Sudan is that the Muslim government of Sudan kept killing the black Africans in the southern part of their country, and so the black Africans pulled away, and under the uh, auspices of the United Nation and the peacekeepers, they have created their own country. They have their own flag, and you can go to their website today and check it out. The Arabs in the Middle East are against the Jews, and it doesn't make any difference what the nations are. Now, what I am not saying is that right now we are in this kind of a war that Jesus talks about. Nothing like it. But what I am saying is this. That the ethnic hatreds and the national jealousies and the spirit of revenge and the raw greed are all there in the world flowing right below the surface. A new conflict breaks out every few weeks or so. Libya erupts. The Hamas in Gaza shoot rockets into Israel. North Korea rattles its sabers. And those are just a few small examples. All that this is is proof of the fires that burn below the surface. Many people today are looking at all the conflict there is in the world and are saying that the end Jesus speaks of must be right around the corner. Maybe they are right. What I am saying is that the conflict, when it comes, will be much worse than anything we see today, but that the presence of the weapons of mass destruction, the open hatred of people groups for one another, the powerlessness of the United Nations to, to uh, impose peace, and the scarce resources and the competition over them in the world today makes what Jesus says here in verses 6 and 7 a coming certainty. Not speculation, not maybe, not conditional. It will happen. As I look at the world today and read the news and pay attention to what's going on, I realize that right now the world is an open keg of gunpowder in a room full of children playing with matches. Now, almost everyone sees the problem. People who don't know the Bible are trying to fix things with education and social programs, a strong international court, and lots and lots of sensitivity training, but they're not making much of a dent in the problem. The human heart is the problem, and only Jesus can fix that. For my part, I am praying for peace so that more people will have time to come to Jesus for salvation. The third thing that Jesus talks about, and again, we're going to do three this week and three later. The third thing is uh, the second half of verse 7, where he talks about famines and earthquakes. And I guess I'd just like to talk about natural disasters. It happens that in the past seven days in our own country, 
We have experienced an earthquake in the eastern portion of the country, and in roughly the same area, a hurricane has slammed ashore, causing great damage. I'm now hearing that it may be, it may rank right up there with the worst national natural disaster that our country has ever suffered, more from the flooding than the wind. The earthquake that happened last Monday was a 5.9 on the Richter scale, which, relatively speaking, is a baby one. The quake that hit Haiti last January, a year and a half ago, was a 7.0, which means that it was about 10 times stronger than the one that hit the eastern coast this week. The 7.0 quake that hit Haiti just about wiped out most of the island. Most of the buildings and the structures were damaged on the island, and many thousands of people were killed, ruined the whole infrastructure. The quake that hit Japan in March was an 8.9. That makes it a hundred times bigger than the one that hit Haiti, and a thousand times bigger than the one that rocked the eastern portion of the United States on Monday. The Japan quake was one of the worst ones in recorded history. It involved massive loss of life, broken transportation systems so that food and supplies could hardly be shipped from one place to the other, fuel, medical care, all communications were gone, radio, cell phones, TV, electric power was gone, just unfathomable numbers of buildings collapsed, whole villages were wiped off the face of the map. Now this is the kind of thing, what happened in Japan, that is going to be taking place all over the world. The world will not be able to put things back together when this happens. Right now, let's take Haiti, for example, or even Japan. When something happens like this, the rest of the world rushes to help. And they bring supplies and food and, and uh, equipment to lift up buildings off of trapped victims and so on. But when the quakes hit that Jesus is talking about, there will be no one to help. These wars and the quakes and the other natural disasters that will be part of this will bring about widespread famine. Jesus says so in verse 7. Now here in Oceana County, people may come up with a fine to get something to eat, and maybe not. But what about those in the cities of the world? What about the people who live in urban centers that, that depend on the thousands of semi-trucks loaded with food to come into the city and sell groceries and, and supply restaurants and so on. All that is going to go away. In verse 21, let me read this verse. Jesus says here, For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. So what he says in verse 21 is that the distress of these days, whether it be because of an earthquake, or the famine, or the storms, or the wars, and the devastation, and all the cruelty that takes place during that, there never will have been a time when it will be worse than th these days. For those of you who are interested in the portion of the book of Revelation that corresponds to this time, it is described in Revelation 6, 1 to 8. And let me just take the time to read that. Revelation 6, 1 to 8. John is, is writing, and here's what he says. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals, and then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a black horse. 
Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. This is talking about a time when food has become horribly expensive, and that would be during a time of famine. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword and famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. And so that's how it's put in Revelation. Again, I am going to remind you that all of you who are born-again persons, years before this, have been taken away. And those who, have not, who are not truly born-again people will be left to endure uh, all of these things. Now I said last week that as we went through these series of messages that I wanted to spend some time getting at what we might call the end time attitude about things. So Peter is someone who writes about this end time attitude and so here is what he says in 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is near, Peter says. Therefore, above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. So Peter is saying that there is a connection between, between being convinced that the end is near and the way that we relate to one another in the family of God. Love each other deeply. So, I'd like to ask the question this morning, what is it about the nearness of the end that makes loving people so important? What is it about the nearness of the end that makes loving people so important? Well, let me turn this around a little bit and say it differently, and I think I can help answer the question. So, let's, let me paraphrase what Peter says this way. Peter speaking, and he says, you and your fellow Christians are about to enter heaven, he says, and you will be leaving everything else behind. People are what matter to God. Because the end is near, now is the time to open up to the others who are members of the family of God. And then before he signs off, he says, warning, because we are still sinners, this is is going to call for a deep love that will overlook faults and wrongs done. So what Peter is saying here is that when the world starts shaking, all of our stuff is going to fall from our hands and we are going to grab for our people. When everything is said and done, the only thing we are going to take with us to heaven are the relationships that we have made with those who have joined us in following Jesus Christ. So this is one of the reasons I am so passionate about our connect groups that we have. Um, it's the end of August, and at the end of September, we are going to launch these connect groups, and we are looking for leaders and hosts that understand the above-all-else aspect of the relationships that we are trying to build within our church family. Let me, let me, uh, and I, interestingly enough, I sort of ran across this verse by accident. Um, let me read to you what the, the author of Hebrews says in verse 10. He says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. So he, he says, come together, come meet. Don't just be a loner, come together and meet. He says, let us come together and worship or excuse me, encourage one another. Let's encourage one another. And then he says, and all the more as you see the day approaching. All the more as you see the day approaching. You see these words? What, what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that as the end approaches, we need each other more. We need to encourage one another. We need to speak words that cause courage to rise up within us. 
And you can't do that on an island all by yourself. You do that in community with other people. And so the end time attitude that I would like to encourage as, we, as I close this morning is the, the high regard for the value of relationships among the people of God as the world begins to implode and increasingly be dysfunctional but as the kingdom of God advances strong all right through it, people are going to need to encourage one another. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the vision of Jesus and for his uh, decision to tell us what is coming. We take his words and give full weight to them. We take them seriously. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you would do uh, your work in our lives. Help us to uh, uh, be careful to follow Jesus Christ. Be careful to love the truth and speak the truth and to uh, love the others in the family of God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.